The following podcast is a W2M Network original production. Visit W2Mnet.com for all of our other great podcasts, plus news, reviews, articles, and opinions from the worlds of wrestling, video games, football, and entertainment. Wrestling to the Max. Monday Night Raw Review. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, welcome to another great Wrestling of the Max Raw review for April 2nd, 2018. I, of course, am Gary Vaughn, and along with me is Mr. Brandon Bisco being. Hey, hey, hey. And Brandon, I don't know about you, man, but I am stoked to get a chance to talk about the last Monday Night Raw before we get to WrestleMania 34. This is the term, the go-home show. It's the go-home uh, show. <laughs> yeah. So you know there was full of different things to hype us up for WrestleMania 34. Lots of interesting tidbits to get us going. And uh, plenty of action. Uh, they definitely gave us more action than I ever expected. I was waiting for many, many, many highlight videos and things like that. But they honestly, uh, it was a little more fisticuffs and things to get us really revved up in that direction. So I'm happy to talk about that. So I, I just, you know, want to make sure before we get this thing going, I do let everybody else out there know, make sure you go find us on W2Mnet.com. That's the place you go find us when it comes to the web. Hey, and also, Hey, wherever you get your podcast from, whatever platform you use, iTunes, Stitcher, maybe even YouTube, make sure you go check us out and find us through the W2M Network. Just type in W2M Network, hit that subscribe button, and you'll get us every single week, all our great review shows, and of course, also the regular episodes of Wrestling of the Max every single week, plus all the other great podcasts that are a part of the W2M Network, which includes sports, entertainment, as well as video games, and plenty of wrestling for all you wrestling fans that are listening to us tonight. Yeah, so uh, before, uh, also, uh, make sure 411mania.com and lastworldprowrestling.com also get some love, too. I almost forgot, but I'm glad I didn't because they are amazing. They'll also have some great stuff coming up here for WrestleMania 34, so go check them out. Plus, w2mnet.com will have plenty of that as well. But, Brandon, I am ready to get down and dirty with this thing, man. Uh, are, are you ready, ready to go, man? Oh, I'm ready. All right, well, let's start out with this opening segment. And, of course, they start out with... None other than Triple H and Stephanie McMahon. They come down to the ring as Jonathan Coachman calls them down. And then he introduces Kurt Angle and Ronda Rowdy. Uh, I almost messed up. I almost <laughs> called her. Right, Kurt Angle did in this thing. I was just Rowdy, about to say, who Rowdy. are you, Kurt Angle now? I know, right? <laughs> so anyway, let's just say it. It is Ronda Rousey. And she comes down here as well. And this thing gets down and dirty because, well... You have the slide comments, the ugliness coming from Triple H and Stephanie McMahon. And then on the other side, you got Kurt Angle and Ronda kind of playing defense a little bit here and throwing their little comments back and forth as coach kind of sits in the middle uh, during this whole thing. And he's kind of trying to get a, a word in edge wise. Doesn't really work out mm -hmm. completely, uh, but they give their barbs back and forth. Uh, Finally, Coach gets to ask a few questions, but really those questions weren't really what matters here. Really what it is is you just need to know this. Stephanie McMahon and Triple H feel like Ronda really screwed up by taking up sides with Kurt and that she just should have followed the rules, followed whatever they put in place and not ask or question anything. But since she did, she's going to pay the price. She's already lost millions of dollars and cost WB millions of dollars. And Kurt Angle says that they need to give her more respect. Um, then you have Coach at the end here basically say, let's be very cordial. Let's take our pictures, and then we can all leave nice and peacefully. We all know that's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> what happens? Well, not only does Kurt Angle get knocked out of the ring, but guess what? Ronda Rousey gets put through a table. So this thing, like I said, it, it ended like any other contract signing, even though it wasn't even a contract signing Brandon, it was just a press conference type thing here. What did you think about it? I mean, I liked it for what it was. Um, I mean, I it, it would have been a little more interesting. I understand why they didn't answer any of Rhonda or Kurt, well, mostly Rhonda's questions. Um, it's a typical heel tactic of deflection. Um, but 
Um, two big moments that really stood out for me in this is one Triple H's whole thing of saying, oh, these fans are going to turn on you very quickly once you lose. And I, I forget the exact quote he said, but he said, like, they're going to turn on you. Uh, I, I for, like he said something very specific and then he paused and then said yes. what he was thinking. But the way he put it made every smart in the world know exactly what he was thinking. And he's not wrong. And mm-hmm. that is that if Ronda Rousey shows that she cannot handle herself in a WWE ring, if she shows that she is not, you know, cut up to be a professional wrestler, which I personally, I have faith in her. I think she's going to do fine. I think she's going to be able to handle herself as a technical wrestler. But if she does not, every fan is going to turn against her, and then she's going to probably disappear into the abyss. Uh, But, you know, that's kind of where they were leaning towards on that, I feel. Um, The other big part that I... I want to mention here, and I I get it, it's WWE's MO, it's the whole reverse momentum theorem, but really, really, do you really want us to take it seriously that Stephanie freaking McMahon can suplex Ronda Rousey? Are you joking me? I get that they're trying to make Rousey different. I get they're trying to make Rousey more of a WWE superstar, more along, you know, more in with the rest of the roster. Mm -hmm. But she is still, yes, I get she lost her last two UFC fights, but still, she should be treated more along the lines, not in terms of the scheduling, not at all, because that would completely destroy her. But in terms of the way she is portrayed on TV, she should be treated more a la Brock Lesnar or Shayna Baszler. Or even, you know, to a much lesser extent, Sonya Deville. Gang yeah. suplex by Stephanie, Stephanie McMahon just completely destroys this whole thing. I get, I get it. I get that WWE is so enamored with this whole reverse momentum theorem. But it's stupid. It's stupid, it's stupid, it's stupid. You're not points, I completely agree. I was not a fan of that. And, you know, you just look at it, okay, so quickly, and you I said, goes on, I meant Triple H, got my guys mixed up. But and that part right there, you got Stephanie McMahon and Ron on the sides. It's the guys that are more aggressive. Occur. Sorry about that, guys. I don't know what my uh, audio here kind of crackled out on us, but uh, hopefully it sounds good now. Uh, my point, though, with everything Brandon just said, I, I got to make the editorial note. I said it was Kurt Angle thrown out of the ring. It was not. It was Triple H. Um, but let me say this. I agree with this, the fact that they are really making Ronda look a little silly here. Mm-hmm. And I, I think really it is because of just what you said here. She is a notable fighter. She's done a lot in UFC. Everyone knows professional wrestling. Everyone, yes, you have the kids and all the, the you know people that don't really pay a lot of attention to pro wrestling who may still feel kayfabe is alive. But let's be honest, most and majority of people know this is a scripted thing and all that. And, and I get that. And that's why they can get away with stuff like this. But I just per se don't like it because the reality of it is really ripped away from you. We all know that in real life, Rhonda would do exactly what she said in this promo, right? She, you know, I, I, which I love, by the way, asking Stephanie mm-hmm. which arm she writes with. That way she knew which one to rip off so she could still get her paycheck signed. <laughs> that I was that. great. Right, and that's the good stuff. That's the reality, right? That's the stuff you would have heard in UFC. If this was a UFC fight, Stephanie McMahon on UFC, that's exactly what you would have heard. And, and not only that, I will say, let me just say real quick, I like that she's getting a lot better than she was at Royal Rumble, 
and an mm-hmm. elimination chamber at promos. She she seemed, at least to me, like she was a lot more comfortable. So that's a good sign. Definitely, and not as smiley. A little mm-hmm. bit smiley, but not as smiley as before. It was almost like she couldn't stop, right? Mm-hmm. She just had that unable ability or whatever you want to call it. She just couldn't do it. So, I mean, you're right. And I look at this also and, and taking a perspective now that we're going to go to WrestleMania. And, yes, Triple H, that same way you were talking about where Triple H says they're all going to cheer you. But once you lose to us, it's going to be dead silence. And I think what basically he's saying is just what you're alluding to is if she's not sharp and she doesn't look like she belongs in a WWE ring or any other wrestling ring, people are going to boo her or they're just not going to react to her anymore. And that's a big issue for WWE. And let's hope that doesn't happen. So I don't know. I, I think they did a lot of good things in this, but you are totally right. They ripped the reality out of this at the end. I really felt like other than that, it was a pretty strong performance, I think, by all. Yeah, I mean, I liked the performance. Um, I mean, I liked while, you know, it. see, there were two moments. The, the two moments that were probably the most uh, prevalent and the most... Um, you know, the ones that popped out of you the most were also the two moments that, especially as a more smarkier fan, really took you out of this whole feud, most of all. The mm-hmm. first, like you mentioned, with, you know, le- well, like we both mentioned, with the whole thing of Triple H saying, once you lose to us, which really meant what once you prove that you can't handle yourself in a WWE ring, the fans are all going to go silent for you, which really means that they're all going to boo you, especially if the rumors are true that they're thinking about throwing her to Asuka a couple in, uh, at next year's Mania. Uh, but, you know, once that happens, once they think you can't handle yourself in a WWE ring, and once you don't show up every week following Mania... You know, the tur- the fans are going to turn on you, and, you know, you're not going to get these cheers anymore. Uh, that was the biggest, that was one of the bigger moments, and then obviously the Stephanie, you know, suplexing her into a table was another big moment where it's like, really? Seriously? Um, while intentional or not, Rhonda kind of salvaged it by kind of at least in part, no-selling the the suplex. Uh, so, you know, I mean, we'll have to see. Uh, like I mentioned, I mean, this just oozes reverse momentum theorem for me. Uh, but, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. But, I mean, especially... I mean, if they do it the right way, especially with the, the promos that they've had over the last couple of uh, weeks, I honestly think, and, and I saw rumors about this is what they wanted to do with this whole feud. And if they could do it properly, and Ronda is serious about being a full-timer and everything, this could be a female version of Stone Cold versus Vince. And I'd be okay with that. Oh, I mean, that's a, if anything could even touch that, I think we would be ecstatic. Yeah. <laughs> and, and let's hope that they can get close to it. I mean, I, I know it probably will not be like that, but no. if you can get close to it, yeah. that's the step in the right direction. right? Yes. And uh, that's what we're all least hoping for. And most of the time, we kind of like to compare and really kind of look at those great moments in wrestling, especially in WWE. And say, can they meet that potential? Can they get there? And I I think you're right. I think that they do have that potential, but it's going to be a tough road ahead for them because Mm -hmm. you're talking about someone who's not exactly, you know, a seasoned veteran in the, you know, the ring. You're also talking about a someone who in Stephanie McMahon who has been around forever and knows the ins and outs of it. So it's going to be a little bit of the flip flop side of this where, you know, Vince was good on the mic, but he was not a wrestler. And you have Stone Cold, who was everything. Uh, great on the mic, great. In, so it, it's almost like roles are reversed here, which, mm-hmm. you know, I don't know. But I, I think it could be something special, at least for this generation, if they really do a good job. And I hope they do. 
Mm. We look at this matchup. Really bright about the man. All this I'm. You know, Brandon, I mean, I, I think the one thing I'll say is I, I'm ready definitely to see this match. I mean, I, I know you probably are like me on that. Maybe not, but I, I think we've seen enough. I, I just think it's time to get in the ring. Oh, yeah, definitely. I completely agree with that. Um, you know, I'm definitely looking forward to this match. But um, more than anything, in terms of this match, it's more of how they build upon it. Um, I think we all can agree that it's pretty obvious that Kurt and Ronda are going to go over in this match. Um, but the big question is, is Ronda serious? Is she actually going to be there full time? What are they going to do with her following this match? You know, um, and that's really going to determine what ha- what the repercussions of this match is. Yeah, definitely. And it's going to be really interesting. So, I know we're looking forward to seeing what happens with that, and we'll get our answer in you know, a little less than a week. So, yep. uh, Let's talk about another situation we have going on right now. Uh, we have Bailey in a match against Sonya Deville, and of course, in tow is Mandy Rose. And uh, we uh, have this match really kind of break down here. Uh, Bailey is going in and really trying to keep you know an eye on Mandy while still trying to defeat you know what Sonya Deville has to offer here and it looks like she does and she knocks Mandy Rose off and is able to roll up Sonya Deville here um but that doesn't mean it's the end of the road here because Mandy jumps back in the ring and starts to beat down Bailey when Sasha comes out to save the day but then Bailey lets her know I do not need you uh which kind of Makes Sasha a little upset here. Bailey attacks Sasha, but guess what? You know, then they are starting to get attacked again. And Mandy and Sonya come back and in and try to take them down, uh, both women out. So this is a situation where it's no, you know, no matter if Fab Solution is there or not, it doesn't look like Sasha and Bailey are still on good terms. Yeah, I mean, and. While a lot of people, you know, some traditionalists may disagree with me on this, I like this sort of storyline. It reminds me a lot of how uh, the whole Shane and Daniel versus KO and Sammy feud was starting out, at least. Now I think it's pretty more, it, it's a lot more clear cut. Well, maybe not necessarily, but more, much more clear cut than it was. But this feud. Um, and I'm sure we'll get, you know, because this is WWE after all, I'm sure we'll get a more clear-cut, uh, determination of who is supposed to be the good guy and bad guy in this whole situation, uh, during Mania and on the night, on the Raw after Mania. But, this feels like a feud where you could go either way and you wouldn't be wrong. I agree. Uh, you know, I, it's been kind of funny because, you know, many people come and say this is time for Bailey to play that role of the heel. And uh, we've talked about this before. You know, Sasha, she's just a natural. She's really good at it. But it is seemingly a situation where Bailey looks more and more like the heel here in this situation. So it's a new side of her. Maybe it brings up some new interest from the fans and, of course, from maybe the people backstage and seeing what she can do, how well-rounded is Bailey. And But you're still right on that. Yeah, I don't disagree with you. You know, they're, they're both good at it, and, you know, it'll come pretty soon for us to find out who really is supposed to be the, the heel and the baby face in this situation. Mm-hmm. So. Which, I mean, I'm personally perfectly fine with them having it be that shades of gray type of situation where you know it's just those two having a disagreement and them saying you know i don't like the way you've been treating me and the other one saying yeah i agree you know and then them just going at it because of that without their distinctly needing to be a you know distinctive face heel alignment yes i know wwe in the whole pg era is back to the 80s but you know 
most fans, especially the smarkier fans, I would think would like a return back to that more Shades of Grey, Attitude Era type style where we can root for whoever we want to root for and it doesn't matter. Exactly. And I'm looking forward to, you know, to kind of breaking this thing down once they do find more, uh, you know, of the route and direction they're going to go with it. But as we sit here, you know, we're still, we're still asking questions, right? Mm -hmm. And that's my thing. As long as I'm still asking questions, I'm interested, but yet, I mean, it's kind of hard to have an opinion when those shades of gray are so gray, you just don't know who you're supposed to root for. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I really don't know who I'm supposed to root for well, at the moment. I think it's not so much it, – it, that's the thing. The, the best kind of storylines, at least to me when it comes to wrestling, is the storylines where, you know – you know, yes, you yes, you love the type of situations like a Daniel Bryan, like you know, going into New Japan, like an, a Kenny Omega type situation, where there is a very distinctive baby face that you know, okay, I'm rooting for this guy no matter what, and and once they get their moment, then it's you know that awesome feeling, and everything, but at the same time. At least in terms of just building, you know, a feud and everything, I'm perfectly fine with, especially in WWE and, you know, in other promotions as well, them just simply saying, you know, these two are having a feud. It doesn't matter who you root for. It's just those two going at it, and they're just going to have a match. Simple as that. You can root for whoever you want to. And it kind of builds to where, you know, fans are more invested because it's like, I'm more of a Bailey fan, or I'm more of a Sasha fan, you know, so it, it, it feels more natural on a sports level instead of the very fabricated, you know, oh, you're supposed to root for this person, and, and... You know, if you think about it, that's a you know that's what's causing a lot of the problems within WWE right now, of WWE kind of forcing upon the fans this is the person you're supposed to be rooting for, and the fans saying no, screw you, we're gonna root for their opponent just because. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I like what you're saying here, and I would agree, but I think it's when it comes to a bigger scale is when I'm I'm more into that when it's not such a big deal and at the moment really let's be honest bailey and sasha are not the biggest deal here i, I mean, agree with that uh, i mean they so, should be a lot bigger but i i mm -hmm. think they'll be one of the main feuds of you know what is it payback or whatever the the next pay-per-view yeah 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 i think it is payback if, if we're both right on that i don't know but i, I think it is I, I think when you're talking about this though this is perfect uh you know headway into the next thing we're going to talk about finn balor taking on seth rollins and, and this is another situation where you know who are you a fan of and the great mm -hmm. thing about this is, is you could be a fan of either of these guys and really enjoy their work plus if you know i know you're not a miz guy but the guys and gals out there that do like the miz and this triple threat we'll be seeing at wrestlemania it's going to be a lot of fun, but yet you can still have those same question marks that you had him, you know, like we're talking about with Bailey and Sasha here. And, you know, it, this match was a lot of fun for me. I, I'm a huge Balor fan. I think Seth Rollins is a great performer. I love him uh, for, just for his athleticism. Not really just a giant fan of his just in general, though. These guys put on a really darn good match. Uh, what, what would you expect? Anything less? I don't think so. No. Uh, so, I mean, really, they played it pretty down the middle. I mean, let, let's be honest. This is pretty close to 50-50 as you can get, man. Mm -hmm. But in, in, in the end here, it does come down to Finn Balor finally getting himself curb stomped at the end and uh, the one, two, three. So Seth Rollins technically wins this match just going into WrestleMania with a little bit of momentum here, but... I think really this was just telling us a story of man, these guys are really even. Yeah, I mean this match was very much a pure, you know, indie New Japan type style, just purely wrestling match. These two going at it and and just fighting to see who's the better man. Um, you know, I'll talk about you know, like I mentioned before, you know. 
uh, you know, I'm I'm curious. I, I know uh, Cage Side, which is a website that I follow a lot. Um, someone was doing a study on this before, but maybe for wrestling for W2M Net, I may actually go ahead and like you know start at Mania and go throughout the whole next year and try to see you know just how uh just how uh um just how conclusive this theory is but i mean i'm sure a lot of fans have heard it before but you know the whole reverse momentum theory of whoever wins at the go home show is inevitably going to lose at the at the pay-per-view uh so this may lead to you know i i had a feeling ever even ever since you know a little before Royal Rumble that Miz was, or not Miz, uh, Balor was going to win the Intercontinental title. Uh, so I think he will win the title at, at Mania. Um, but, you know, this also kind of puts some credence to it. Uh, but, I mean, yes, this match was great. Um, a great technical match. But honestly, and, you know, I know you're more of a Miz fan than I am, so you may actually like this. Um, but, uh, are they really trying to go the route of Miz 2013 all over again now with, uh, his baby being born? I don't think so. I, I you know what, there's you been You think talking. this was just a one-off thing? Yeah, I really don't think we're going to be seeing a lot of huge success for the Miz just because he had a child. No, 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 no. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying are they going to go face Miz for a little bit before realizing that it's a complete and utter flop? I I, I, I don't think so. I, I just... Ah. Okay, I'll give you a great example of watching Raw. My wife's in the room and... You know, she's kind of making comments about the fact, you know, Miz talking about the baby and all this stuff and just about how cocky he is and that kind of stuff. I really don't feel like that they're going to go that route per se, you know, just because of the baby. I think it's going to be more of a, an addition to the, the heel character. I really feel like he's going to be cocky and talk about how he's the best and he's going to prove it to his kid and all this kind of stuff. And some people might find that endearing. Uh, but I think some others are going to find that highly annoying. Okay. No, no, I agree. And I I personally thought it was highly annoying. But it just felt to me, personally, and maybe this is me just being, you know, the very, um, you know, feeling that anything, you know, anything realistic or anything um, truthful coming out of Miz's mouth is automatically a face turn for him because he is so much, you know, just like... He, he is the new Eddie Guerrero, pretty much. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but... You know, it just felt like he was being too facey here. And it just felt like, oh god, they're gonna go down the route of you know, I forget what year, 2012, 2013, when they randomly decided to try to turn him face, and then it completely flopped on its face, and then, you know, they were like, and then they just completely threw it to the side. Uh, but, you know, I I just, I have a feeling that they may go that route just for a little bit, and then it'll flop on its face again, and then they'll reverse course again. I see that scenario more than anything. I, I will go with you on that. If it is more of a short-term situation, okay, I get you. Long-term, though, a, a year of it, I don't, I don't see it. Oh no, um, I don't, I don't see mm-hmm. it either. But not for lack of trying. That's what I'm trying to say. Mm-hmm. Is that I think they're, I think they are going to try to like semi-turn him face while keeping his character intact, but to any fan that isn't a complete smark or isn't a complete mark for Miz, they're going to just laugh at it and be like, this is still the Miz. Screw you. Yeah. I mean, that could be the case. And for the fact that we also, I think, believe we have Miz and our Miss and Mrs. or mm. wow, whatever they say that show. Uh, isn't that coming out this year? I mean, I isn't it coming out so. pretty I, soon? I have no idea. 
If it is, uh, that could be a great reason for that. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, for him to play up that and really talk about the baby and all that kind of stuff, that would get viewers interested in watching the show, and you would mm-hmm. want him to be kind of likable <laughs> yeah. leading it to a show. And so you would think, yeah. But who knows? I mean, I really don't. I really have no idea. I haven't paid attention to when that show is going to come out or whatever. But, nope. you know, it, it, the Miz and whatever he's doing, it's not bad because he's great on the mic. He does his job. And, and I think he's going to get his point across. And, you know, I, I don't know uh, that he'll be holding the Intercontinental title long. I don't know who yeah. it's going to be, but I just don't see it. We'll talk more about that this week, but I, I don't know. So I'm thinking Balor wins on Sunday. Yeah, and I would love it. I'll be honest with you. So would I, I would yeah, overly love it. So I'm wearing a uh, Balor shirt right now. Oh, there you go. See? Let's talk about the bar though. Uh the bar comes out and they address Braun Strowman. Uh they let Braun know that they are not really interested as much as they were at once uh, about Braun and his tag team partner. And saying it's, you know, well, not a big deal, you know, because they're going to beat whoever it is because they're the bar, right? Well, Braun says, well, you know, if you're willing to know, I got the guy. I just talked to him, and he's very similar to me. And he says he'll come out in one condition if one of you will have a match with him. And they kind of look at each other and banter back and forth, and the bar agree. Yeah, hey, we'll do that. That's not a problem. We'll take on your guy. And so Braun says, let me go let him know. He's very close to, to me. Well, goes back and then comes back with a white shirt on <laughs> and says, I am brains. My brother Braun sent me out here, and I'm about to bash your brains out. And he basically looked like a, a larger version of Bubba. I know, didn't he? <laughs> so great. Especially with the glasses. I was like, is that Bubba Ray Dudley? <laughs> I know. I I really loved it. It makes me wonder if it was kind of an homage to Bubba. But oh, it had to have been. Yeah, it really did. Uh, but this doesn't last long. Uh, Braun gets in the ring. The bar attacks him. Of course, he makes quick work of them. They get out of the ring as fast as they can and uh, tuck tail and go up the ramp. And that kind of ends it. So, I mean, we got no answer. Um, we thought we got an answer. And they kind of, you know blew smoke up our butt till we noticed it didn't actually take place. So here we are. We still don't know who the tag team partner for Braun is, but I thought this was entertaining. I oh, had yes. no problem with this. Oh, this was a great segment because it worked in two ways, both on a, you know, KFAB level and on a, you know, purely storytelling level. On the KFAB level, it's great uh it's great mind game work by Braun Strowman on the bar being like Hey, you want to know who my partner is? Okay, here you go. Oh, never mind. I'm not going to tell you. You can guess all you want until Mania. And I'm going to reveal it right at Mania. Great mind game playing by Braun. And then on a storytelling level, it was a great bait and switch. It was a great job of them saying, Oh, yeah, we're going to tell you who who the partner is. Oh, wait, never mind. Nope, you got to wait until Mania. Yeah, Mm -hmm. um... And I'm just, I've seen the rumors, I I, I kind of get it, I guess, but I'm really, really, really hoping that they pull out something out of their hats for this. Because if it's just going to be Elias Sampson, or, you know, someone else who's on the roster or anything. I mean, Big Show I'd be okay with. Because they're both big guys and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And kind of give Big Show a last hurrah with a title. But if they're just going to give it to Elias or someone else who's on the main roster regularly, then what was the point in all of the stalling? If you're gonna save it for Mania, make it someone big. Make it a memorable moment like what you had with the Hardys last year. So you're saying you want it to be James Storm? Pretty much, yeah. Or, like, (laughs) um, well, I wouldn't want James Storm because I don't like him. But, uh, you know... (laughs) <laughs> I, I know he's injured, so I'm highly doubting that this is possible, but, you know, if Mysterio wasn't injured, that would have been an interesting spot. 
Um, I can't really think of many signees. Like, I don't know what the deal is with Lashley, but, like, if Lashley is signed with WWE now, you know, pop him in as, as a surprise. That would be a cool spot. Um, you know, even if, you know, I know, I think I heard something in an interview of, like, you know, Goldberg saying, you know, never say never about, you know, another run. So, you know, toss him in there or something. You know, have someone, have it be someone that would actually garner a pop. Not just someone on the main roster like, oh, okay, that's cool. Yeah, I, I know. I, I'm going through my mind as you're speaking of this, and I'm thinking, okay, who could it be? You know, Samoa Joe is a big, awesome guy, but I don't think that that pairing is going to be in place because, well, they want Samoa Joe to do other things and not really be yeah. a tag guy. And not only that, that's a powerhouse team that's unbelievable. But, uh, I mean, that yeah. would I'd be okay with that because it would be a powerhouse team, and that would be, you know, okay, you could do something with that. Yeah, but I like your idea of Mysterio, and yes, we don't know the injury situation, and I think, honestly, Braun would take most of the, you know, in reaction compared to Mysterio if they needed him to. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there's a few guys, I would, I'll be honest with you, I, I mentioned it, Drake Maverick would be a fun guy uh, for me. Honestly, you know what I just thought of? The so. one guy that I'd be perfectly fine with, granted he's an NXT guy, so it's not as, you know, huge, oh my god, pop type of situation. But, you know, it would get a pretty nice pop a la uh, Adam Cole. Oh my god, I can't believe I almost Oh Adam. god. <laughs> kill me now, please. Just, okay. Just kill me now. <laughs> Thank you for saying that because let me just mention this. If it is Michael Cole for any godforsaken reason. No, no, then... I wasn't going to say him. I was going to say the other Cole, but please kill me now for saying oh, that. Oh, Adam Cole? Yes. Oh, boy. No, no, no. I, no, I wasn't going to say that it was Adam Cole. I was going to say that this would be a pop kind of like Adam Cole was during the Royal Rumble. Where everything, yes. everyone was so surprised that he suddenly showed up, even though, yes, he's in NXT. But just because ever since they both kind of made their rise, which was kind of at the same time, their rise to prominence within each respective brand, um, you know, everyone's been talking about the Battle of the Behemoths, Braun Strowman against Lars Sullivan. Mm-hmm. Have Lord Sullivan be his surprise uh, partner. I'm a huge Sullivan guy, so, so if that happens, I would be ecstatic. Oh, so would I. I would love uh, it. Oh, God, it'd be so much fun. <laughs> and, uh, and it would be so funny because, like, everyone always talks about how there's, like, no big guys in wrestling anymore. It's all high-flying and everything. Uh, that would prove them wrong because then you could have... And then... Call up War Machine. Have War Machine just completely bypass NXT and have the Battle of the Behemoths on Raw After Mania between Lars Sullivan and Braun Strowman and War Machine. Could you imagine that match? Uh, I, I would actually <laughs> want to fly to whatever city the... Uh, or actually, it's New Orleans. Yeah, Duh. New Orleans. It's New Orleans. I would have to fly to New Orleans that night. I'd have to, you like, could you drive know, to New far. Orleans. Are you in Texas? I'm Dallas. I'm in yeah. Dallas. I could... I could get down there in a, in a decent time span. Um, man, just I, I, that blows my brains out. <laughs> I, I'm excited. <laughs> I, I would love to see that. I know it's not going to happen. Oh, We're, no, we are I know it's not going to happen either. But. Way beyond our measure here. Uh, but I want to say this, and you hit me with some lightning because you mentioned the name Cole. I thought Michael Cole – wouldn't you love it if Braun comes out WrestleMania and he's standing there and they're like, "Who's your tag team partner?" And he says, "I didn't, I didn't actually choose one." And then Angle comes out and says, "You have to have one." We told, talked about this, and he just simply goes over to Michael Cole and taps him, "You're coming with me," and makes <laughs> Michael Cole be his tag team partner. And Cole just stands there on the apron and then proceeds yep. to go two and zero at Mania. Yes, and they uh, win the tag yeah. belts. Michael Cole has a huge head at next the next night on Monday Night Raw that he's a tag champion, and then Woken Hardy comes out with his brother Nero to oh, challenge. God, 
<laughs> because Michael Cole hates the whole uh, party stuff, though. So. That would be hilarious. I mean, it would be terrible in the sense that, like, the fans would just go completely ballistic on it. But at the same time, it would be hilarious to see. I know. So I'm not saying that's going to be fact, but it would be uh, just an awesome moment. So yeah. let's see what happens with that. But we're talking about Woken Matt Hardy. Let's go ahead and mention him again because we had Goldos come out and kind of cut a video promo about the Andre the Giant Battle Royal. Of course, Woken Matt Hardy interrupts it and gives his spill on how he feels about it. And then these two guys get in the ring and they have a match. And it's a decent little match here. Nothing super spectacular. The right guy goes over. Woken Matt Hardy wins. Uh, and, of course, stands in front of the Andre the Giant uh, Battle Royal trophy and does his whole, oh, yeah, the whole thing. I love it. Uh, so and he we'll will get procure that home. it. Yes, procure. I love that. He kept saying procure, procure. Oh, it was awesome. <laughs> I, you know, it depends on what side of the fence you land on when it comes to Woken Matt Hardy. I enjoyed this. I'm sure some people listening right now who are not on board were like, good God, I couldn't wait till this was over. What did you think about the whole thing, though? Oh, I loved it. I mean, I love uh, Woken. I still call him Broken Hardy because he will always be Broken Hardy to me. Um, but I, I loved, I forget, I think it was in the promo that I had prior to the match. He was mentioning, you know, the the Colo- or uh, the Titans and, you know, all of these other giants of history of, like, you know, legend. It was great. I I love when he mentions different historical, you know, creatures or people or whatnot, you know, that he's, you know, training with them, training with their vessels and everything. It's great. It's just hilarious. Um, And honestly, you know, I, I hate to say it, but, you know, and I'm sure I'll get plenty of hate mail and, you know, Send it my way, you know, Bisco underscore Gotham SN, you know, you can send it to me all you want, but, you know, whether or not you're a fan of Woken Hardy, I think is a very, in, is very indicative of your, you know, IQ and of your, you know, philosophy. If you're more of a history buff, if you're more, if you're more intelligent, you're going to be a fan of him, but you know, if you don't understand half of his jokes, then, or half of his references, then, you know, it's just going to completely fly over your head, and, you know, it, you know, it, you're not going to be a fan of him. Uh, but, you know, I, I love Woken Hardy. Um, I think I mentioned this, uh, last week, uh, but I'm certainly hoping and I would love to see Woken Hardy win the Andre with the assistance of Brother Nero and, you know, the obsolete mule Bray Wyatt. Yes, and you know what's interesting about that we've seen recently in some live events that Wyatt is a little bit different here. Not completely. They have not showed anything major with him, but he's a little bit more odd. He's a little bit more in the vein of being closer to Woken Matt Hardy rather than be the complete villain mm. in this situation. So, and I mean, I think it makes yeah. sense that they're not going to show the complete transformation of him at a house show. I agree. And they're just kind of, you know, using that to get people in the door. Um, But at least they're still making reference to it. And you have Matt, you know, kind of saying things like, hey, you know, you haven't completely changed, but it's time. Do you understand? I'm not, you know, your enemy, things like that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, what WrestleMania is the time we may see something like that because, you know, the Andre the Giant Battle Royal, it needs storylines going in It needs some things to actually, you know, make people care about that match. Exactly. I, I think that's going to be a big one. And you may actually see, you know, Woken Bray Wyatt. I mean, so. that would be the great way to kind of revive the Andre Battle Royal. I mean, yes, last year they had the whole thing with Gronk that got a lot of people, you know, kind of enthused about it. And they've done certain things with it that have kept people's attention, but for the most part, most fans still think of it as just kind of a throwaway battle royal where they're just throwing all the guys that aren't on the card into. Mm -hmm. And having Wyatt maybe, 
you know, you don't even have him come out as one of the participants. You kind of, you know, you have, you know, maybe Matt and, you know, two other guys or maybe even one other guy out there. And then suddenly his music hits or, you know, maybe a, a new version, you know, new but still the same kind of version of Obsolete from TNA hits and have both Wyatt and Jeff come out down the ramp and, you know, distract whoever is in the ring still other than Matt, and that allows him to eliminate the other two, or the other one or other two, or whoever, however many are in the ring. And that allows Matt to win the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal, and that, you know, creates this new Woken Warriors faction. Yeah, and that could be, you know, very well what happens there. I think any way that they can get to it, by just really still placating up all the great, weird, strange stuff, it's going to work out. They can't get off of course, though. They've got to no. keep it odd. They've got to keep it strange. So, yeah, yeah, you've got a point there. And, hey, if it goes the way you're saying, I'm going to be down with it. I really will be. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about John Cena. Uh, this guy has been calling out Undertaker forever. At least that's the way it feels. <laughs> and we're basically being berated by it every Monday night raw. We're getting it berated by it with wrestling news and through Twitter and Instagram, all these different social media things. Still here. We sit Monday night raw. John Cena comes out and, and just a short way of saying this. He was John Cena. He said the same stuff you've heard him say, Talked about how great it was being a fan, all those kind of things, placated to all the cities around the U.S. and, you know, played with the crowd here in Atlanta. Just did this whole shtick, right? Mm -hmm. At the same time, cutting down Undertaker and telling that he left his balls at home, all that grand stuff. And just, you know, trying to be humble at the same time. I, I, it's just John Cena. So we mm. sit here and there is no dong, dong, mm-hmm. none of the, the bell, none of the bell tones ring. No, you know, biker music starts playing. Nothing happens. It's just the end of John Cena's promo. His music hits. He walks back up the ramp. Nothing. So we had a long speech, if you'll call it that, because it's more of a speech to me than really a promo. Mm-hmm. That did nothing but just kind of get to see get to see him interact with the crowd. I was kind of kind of underwhelmed by this. I whole mean, thing. I was definitely underwhelmed by it, but obviously the crowd uh, in Atlanta liked it because we we actually got a John Cena chant. So um, WWE, if you're listening to this, here's the way you get over your your top baby faces. One. Don't have their opponent show up. And two, actually loosen the reins. Because we've seen it over the last, what, month? We've seen it with both Roman and Cena. Your two quote-unquote top baby faces who aren't really your top baby faces because they both are booed out of the building. They both actually got cheered because you let them actually talk and be themselves, actually be a little edgy. Because fans actually want you to be edgy. We don't want this PG PC, you know what. And you, because they didn't have an opponent to talk to, which would overshadow them, they actually got to do what they wanted to do, and they actually got cheered for once. So, hey, that's the way you get it over. So, that's the upside to this. The downside is where this is going, because it's absolutely stupid. Because I know exactly where this is going. John Cena's gonna sit at ringside, acting as though he's a fan, and then suddenly, out of nowhere, we're gonna hear the gong, or we're gonna hear the bike rev, or whatever, you know, persona he's gonna come out as. And he, and Undertaker is going to, you know, s- slow walk his way and make his, you know, 10 minute walk down the ramp. And he's going to go up to John Cena and be like, hey, I'm I'm here. Let's do this. 
and it's going to make absolutely zero sense, but everyone is inexplicably going to love it. At least they hope they love it. <laughs> oh, I'm calling it right now. People are still going to love it because, for whatever reason, they still love it. They do, and, you know, I, I've been, you know, a fan of Undertaker for a long oh, time. Oh, so have I. Yeah, yeah. It, it's just, I, I think my situation here, as I said, is the fact that we've seen the downgrade of Undertaker as time has taken away his ability. And I, it's hard for me to want to get up and watch another match when I, I've seen some of the bad situations yeah. he's been put in. And I, I think John Cena is a great opponent for him because Cena can run the whole entire match. Doesn't have I, to really do much to make Undertaker look good at the same time of be easy on the guy. But I, I don't know. I, I think if I'm going to pop for this whole thing, it's going to have to be paying homage to, you know, biker taker or something of that sort that, mm-hmm. man, Oh, I remember this. Oh, I used to love this. That could, yeah. that kind of pop for me. I, I agree with that. Um, but honestly, you know, this doesn't make, I mean, I get the whole concept, to an extent, at least I hope I get the concept, because, you know, especially, well, Cena's been getting better at this, so, you know, I'll give him some credit where credit credit is due, so, I have a feeling that, you know, this is kind of Undertaker's swan song of, you know, they're gonna let him go over and ride off into the sunset as a winner, um... But if that's not the case, if this is, you know, Cena going over, then it's completely stupid because, you know, I, I'm i still thinking, you know, while, yes, Roman has gotten better over the last year, you know, Undertaker, with his whole persona and everything, he should have been used as a conduit to put over someone of his personality, of his persona, of the newer generation. They had the chance a couple of years ago with Wyatt, and they and they blew that. Mm-hmm. But now, but I thought they should have done it with Balor. Maybe we still get it with Kane because he is a demon that makes a little more sense, but still Undertaker would have been a much bigger, you know, a much bigger, uh, you know, passing of the torch to Balor if they would have done it than Kane it than Kane will be if they still end up doing that. Hopefully, but. I definitely think that they should have done it with someone who could have actually taken in that power and Mm -hmm. used it in a way. Yeah, I think so, too. And I was on board with that all along, you know, and I really felt like that was going to happen. And it just seems like that's not in their plan. And it really bums me out. It really does, because I think the transition of that power is something special. Mm-hmm. I, I really do. It makes me wonder if WB is just afraid that if they do that and the guy fails, they just kind of said that the power of Undertaker failed. But I disagree with that because, I mean, I get that WWE doesn't believe this, but, you know, it really is true. And we've seen it time and time again over the last, you know, eight years. It's all about booking. You know, Mm -hmm. look, you know, biggest case in point, someone who, you know, should have gotten Undertaker's power, Bray Wyatt. If he would, if he would win matches, he would be one of the top guys and would be cheered, you know, either cheered or booed like crazy. But when you have him talking about being a god and then losing 75% of his matches, then his promos fall flat, and you're just like, um, yeah, I don't take you seriously. Yeah. Go away. I agree. Uh, you know, and we've talked about this a lot, you know, on Wrestling at the Max. Uh, I think me and you have talked about it a few times. Oh, I know. I've talked about it a bunch. Because yeah. I used to be, you know, when Wyatt came up, 
I was a huge Wyatt fan, and now it's just like, I don't care about you anymore because I know you're not going anywhere. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep, and that's the biggest problem that we've had. And I, I hope the resurgence of Wyatt, it, it's something that is special. It's something a little different to, to get us back behind him. And I think, you know, once again, WB is at their own fault um, for all that. I, I think, you know, we have a, a something in mind. I just don't think WB really does. And I think it's kind of sad because mm -hmm. we just talked about the transition of power. I think Undertaker, even Kane himself, it would be great to see them transition that power. Um, I mean, Kane's a simple transition. Oh, because yeah. you already have another demon. Yep. Yeah. It's just, you know, what are they gonna do? Are they gonna offer that? And I don't know. Wouldn't you love to see that though? Kane transitions to Balor and, and then, you know, as Balor's entrance when he is the demon, you can have fire involved then. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I would love that. I, I would well, love granted, it. I mean Kane's uh entrance falls flat now with no pyro. Oh yeah. It's kinda sad. It really <laughs> it is. Really Oh, but, you know, Kane in general right now is kind of sad. But, well, yeah, but... Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, you know, we, we could talk all day about this whole thing, but, you know, I, I think really at the end of the day, we're going to get where we're going to get it, Mania, and I think whatever happens, it's going to be probably really fun, and I think, you know, fans are going to pop. You, you brought that up, and I think at the end of the day, we're going to be happy with it, mm -hmm. even though it may not be the best thing on the show. It may not be the moment of the night. We're still going to enjoy seeing Taker mm -hmm. back. We're going to enjoy that moment with John Cena, that match, even if it lasts five minutes. It's just going to be entertaining. So. Yeah. Oh, no, I agree. I agree with that. But at the same time, um, you know, I read an article by someone talking about how, you know, with how stacked this card is, like, you know, where do you find the bathroom break and everything? And now that I think about it, you know, while I hate to say it because I love Taker so much, um, that will probably be my, you know, that that will probably be my match that I don't really care about. Kind of like how the two Rock Cena matches were the two matches that, you know, Back in the day, I would have loved, but, you know, now, because they both kind of sold out, and, you know, in this scenario, because Taker is kind of a shell of himself, it's like, you know, I don't, I don't really care. Yeah. And, and yeah, I, I'm right there with you on that, because it just will be a no-care situation, uh, especially if they kind of make it a little less under what, you know, under what we expect. Mm -hmm. If it's anything under what we expect, it's going to be a flop. So let's hope not. Mm -hmm. uh, let's jump into something else here, though. Uh, this is quite interesting. Let's talk about the next thing we have on the docket, and that, of course, is something that I really say is interesting only for the fact that I think this guy is going to have something good at WrestleMania. Um, but it, besides that, the match here on Raw was just kind of, eh, it's uh, Elias versus Heath Slater. You know, Elias does his thing on the guitar, talking about Atlanta, what a dump it is. Uh, Heath Slater comes out and interrupts the song, and Elias wins. But really what I get out of this, though, is I, I love the fact that Elias still does not have anything major at WrestleMania. They still give him time here. Mm -hmm. And it, it, to me, it spells out... Elias really does matter to WB, and they're going to do something with him. I, it really makes me want to know what that thing well, is. Well, I've seen two rumors, and they're both kind of interesting. And I, well, one's kind of interesting, and I'd actually enjoy seeing. The other, I'm kind of like that would be a big letdown. Do you want to know what those two are? Yes, let me know. Okay. The one that's the letdown I mentioned already with him being the partner of Braun. Uh, but the other one that I saw today was uh, The Rock, you know, having a musical performance with Elias. Yeah, that could happen. Uh, I've yet to hear anything about The Rock even being close to being involved with WWE. Apparently, um, I saw that like there's like a hundred to one, like based on like one of those like weird betting sites that does parlay, like does bets on everything. They've got Rock showing up at at a hundred to one. Hmm. Well, I mean, it, there things can happen, uh, but yeah, that's kind of interesting. A hundred to one, really? Wow. Yeah. What's the other one, though? What's the other rumor we have? 
Well, no, that that that's the other one, is that Rock will be playing a like little set with uh with Elias. And then the first one was that uh Elias would be Braun's tag team partner. Oh, okay. Yes, yes, the tag team partner. Uh, which, uh, you know, I think is leaning more towards that. And here's the thing. You know, I love that they showed on Raw as well. You know, they had Kurt Hawkins come up and try to get to be that tag team partner for Braun. And, uh, mm-hmm. he, you know, Braun asked him in the street, what, what's your record? <laughs> he goes, what can <laughs> not I, so good. you know, yeah, not so good. And he says, well, you can break the streak. And uh, he throws him through a wall and says, yeah, I just broke it. <laughs> Basically, yeah, I love that for Kurt Hawkins. The but, only thing about the yeah. whole Braun rumor that I don't fully get, and which is why I'm at least hoping that it's not the case, is that you would think, like you mentioned, and like we saw on Raw tonight, that you would think that they'd want to do some sort of at least mini thing with Elias sitting in the middle of the ring and playing his guitar and everything and doing a mini concert and whatnot. But if he's the surprise partner for Braun, then that doesn't give you any opportunity for him to do that. Yeah, that's true. That, you know, that would not give me the opportunity. I, you know, I, I think that, you know, there's many scenarios here. And that's what's so mm. fun, though, right? Oh, yes. That makes this a lot more fun than a lot of manias. I mean, last year we got the big surprise of the Hardys returning. But, you know, uh, at the same time, you know, a lot of us who were in the know kind of saw it coming and were like, you know, once once New Day said, you know, there's a third team joining this tag team uh, title match, I think most of us who were in the know knew, oh, it's the Hardys, you know, but we still pop big for it. But, you know, especially now with so many unknowns, with two very distinctive unknowns and then a third kind of, you know, where is Elias going to land on this unknown? It makes this mania very interesting. I was mentioning the Tory earlier. I was like, you know, this is the, you know, this, I'm probably the most excited for this mania that I've been, you know, this is the most excited I've been for a mania in, you know, four or five years. Yeah, I mean, you're right because I mean there's a lot here. But you know, to me, okay, to me looking at this card, it's so stacked. It mm-hmm. really, really is. And and I remember, oh man, a couple of years ago thinking, well, this is a WrestleMania, but there's about five matches that I kind of care about in yeah. a five to six hour show. That's you know kind of uh, that seems like I mean, every other WrestleMania. Last year. Or, yeah, even even last year, you're exactly right, and it just seems like every other pay per view doesn't seem special, and this one does. Mm. This one seems stacked. It seems like there's so much power behind it, and, and you know, I, I think me and you were on the same page, and I'm uh, looking forward to seeing you know several of these feuds. But you know, we're talking about Elias here. I mean, he's been a guy that WWE's really been hanging their hat on for quite a while now, as he's been in here uh, doing his thing and getting the crowd behind him. And now we get a chance to see a guy not have anything going into WrestleMania, and he's still got a buzz. That that mm-hmm. says something. Yeah, I mean, well, him and while, you know, he technically does have something going on, you know, Braun Strowman, you know, a lot of people would say he's very underutilized for Mania this year. Uh, but he, you know, he's still getting a big push right now. Um, and, you know, I'm sure... You know, we'll see what happens with him at Mania with the tag team titles. Um, but, you know, with this whole Mania, um, you know, there really isn't, with with the exception of maybe the uh, Taker Cena match, you know, there really isn't a match that I can say, you know, oh, I don't really care about that match. And also, not only that, in spite of the fact that, you know, most of the matches, we kind of have a good idea of who's going to win. We, Even though that is the case, we don't really care because we know they're going to be good matches. You know, Shinsuke AJ, Asuka Charlotte, you know, even Roman Brock. You know, these matches, you know, we're all excited for because we're, we know they're going to be good matches. 
Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm right there with you. And I'm looking forward just to seeing some of the surprises coming out of all this, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's, so there's going to be so much stuff that, you know, as, as we go on, we're still talking about this Raw. But as we sit here and look at the things we talked about, you know, thus far, man, th- there's so many interesting things coming our way. And uh, so we'll, we'll, you know, of course, talk more about some of these other ones, too, that I think we'll have some things to talk about. You know, even like this Nia Jax thing, right? She gets, her, you know, interview with by Renee Young and Renee Young kind of talks to her about, you know, what's going on with her. And really, you know, it's Nia Jax saying that she's been secure about her weight. And that's what a lot of people kind of heard in the past, kind of having a chance to hear from her. And but she kind of says that she's happy with herself. And who she is. And at the end of the day, really, she, you know, doesn't take crap from anyone. And she's not going to do it from Alexa for sure. So, you know, basically it's her telling us that she's going to squash Alexa like a bug. Um, I think this went over pretty well. We also had, I just want to mention, Alexa Bliss and Mickey James kind of down, uh, you know, her again uh and it's a little promo here and all that so before we get into the matchup that comes up uh, i do want to talk about this nia Jax thing i think they're really doing a good job of you know putting her as the baby face now for a long time they were working on her as being a bad monster all this stuff and all of a sudden now we're looking at nia with sympathetic eyes and as more the baby face here and i, I think for this interview i think you got a good you know, whiff of what they're trying to do here. I mean, I like it. Um, I mean, I'm okay with it. I like what they're doing with it. But at the same time, I would like to see more of that fire of, like, you know, yeah, you can still make her the baby face. I mean, I'm. this is a lot of what we were talking about before with the whole Roman and Cena thing. Um, where WWE seem, you know, nowadays, you know, they're going back to the 80s, apparently, um, where it's like, you know, in order to be a face now in WWE, you have to be very, you know, this very sympathetic, you know, uh, you know, wide-eyed, you know, bushy-tailed, you know, you know, aw shucks type of character. Braun Strowman has broken that mold. And WWE should take note. Braun Strowman is your top face right now. And he Mm -hmm. don't care. He don't Mm -hmm. care what you think. He don't care, you know, what other people think. He just wants to kick your butt. And that's the way they should be building Nia Jax. I'm okay with this to an extent, but she should be saying, you know, yes, you can have her saying, you know, yes, you know, I was bullied in the past, all of this, and, you know, but but then at the end, you should be saying, she should be saying, but I've grown to love myself, and I've grown to know who I am, and you know what, Alexa, you screwed up, and I'm gonna whoop your butt, and you better run. Yeah, you know, and I understand that, and I think that they try to put that into place just in a more subtle manner here, and, you know, I think to each his own. I I kind of get where they're coming from, but I I think you're right. I would love to see more passion, right? And I I think Nia definitely could do that. I think this is still a little bit of a, a learning curve for her, though. Right. Do you do you really feel like this is more on her or do you really feel like this is on W the way it's going down? With with all the things that I've heard, I think this is on WWE. Because I think if they gave people more just pure bullet points that mm-hmm. they would have a and, and if they didn't have such a tight hold of, you know, oh, we gotta keep it safe for the children and all of this you know, uh that a lot of these performers would be a lot more comfortable with loosening those reins and kind of be willing to say what they really want to say. I mean, we saw it, you know, what, three weeks ago or two weeks? Yeah, three weeks ago with reins. Um, You know, when you loosen the reins, pun intended, um, (laughs) they... uh, 
you know, these guys are able to handle themselves. You know, it goes back to that reality stuff you talked about earlier in the show, at the beginning of the show, actually. It's more about reality-based things and discussions and promos and even some of the matches. And I think that's something we want to see, you know, especially for the fans that really do pay close attention to these matches, everything that goes into what's going on in WWE and other places as well. And it's just not the way they do things all the time. And it just kind of sucks. But I think, you know they have to have their tight grip on every single thing. And this is another example of that. And, you know, Nia doing her thing, it works, but sometimes when you're all the points you just made, well, not doing it, make Nia kind of look silly. Yeah. And I don't think this made her look silly, but I, I kind of see your point here. It was not exactly what it should have been or could have been. So it, it kind of makes her look, you know, and I get they're trying to, you know, they they're like oh the only way we can build a face now is to make them the underdogs like a la Dan- mm-hmm. Daniel Bryan, but you know, but like I mentioned, Braun Strowman proves you wrong there. Um, mm-hmm. You know, they're trying to make her the underdog here, which you know I think most fans are like seriously, no, you're not gonna you know we're not that stupid. Yeah, well, this also taps into their thought process of we should be the after school special because there's a lot of women out there that are even young girls that struggle with their weight. So let's go ahead and get them behind Nia Jax because they understand how she feels. Right. Uh, But she's confident and you should be confident, too, kids. That's what they're trying to do. But see, the way they handle it isn't the right way. I feel like you can make her be that confident in a more, in a more, in a much better way by her saying, you know, yeah, like, like what I said before, yeah, I've been bullied, you know, but I learned to accept myself, and I know that my size and my strength is, is a, uh, is an advantage to me over Alexa Bliss, and you screwed up because I'm way bigger than you, so I can just squash Mm -hmm. you like a bug. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, and, and you know, I, I like the more aggressive tones. I like the more uh, aggressive way of going about the whole thing. Yeah. Um, that's just not WWE. So uh, it's just something sadly we have to get over. It just sucks. If and they would do wh- what we're it's saying, it's why WWE is going down, and all of the indies are going up. Oh, see, little that's a hot opinion there. So. Uh, let's do talk about more of this though uh, you know it really goes about where we have a match between Alexa Bliss and Mickey James against none other than Asuka and Dana Brooke and what a weird pairing <laughs> we were just talking about mixed match hodgepodge teams put together not long ago and here we are <laughs> with a weird one uh, oh, but, you, know, you, know, you know who I forgot to mention last week when we were talking about that one that actually showed up on Raw this week because I completely forgot about them because they never show up anymore. The uh, the original, the forebearer to this whole hodgepodge uh, trend, Heat Slater and Rhino. Yep, yep. Now yeah, that's right. So, but we have this situation with Oscar and weirdly enough Dana Brooke, and uh, this match really just kind of starts with Dana Brooke and Alexa. And them really just kind of going throughout this match, and Mickey James and Alexa really controlling Dana Brooks. She has some offense here, but it's really about them. Then, of course, when Asuka gets involved, we all know what's going to happen, mm-hmm. right? She gets the victory with the Asuka lock uh, on Mickey James. Uh, and Alexa just kind of leaves Mickey to high and dry in a way, just kind of gets out of the way of this whole thing. You know, but, you know, Nia Jax coming to get involved and all that. Uh, it's. Just, it all, you know, kind of goes round about where we have the same old story, right? Oh, we're going to tease that there's going to be action and all this stuff, and it doesn't happen. So guess what, guys? you got to wait to the pay-per-view. <laughs> same, th- same thing here. I, I did, I'll i be honest with you. I, I don't really feel like any of this was needed. Well, I mean, it basically is told three stories in one match – which everyone knew what was going to happen. It was 
Asuka winning another match and continuing her undefeated streak. It was Alexa continuing to be a coward and leaving uh, Mickey high and dry because she can't uh, she can't handle herself. And then it was Nia coming in and trying to get her hands on Alexa and Alexa running a little. Running away like a little baby, you know. So it was pretty self-explanatory what was going to happen here. Uh, you know, honestly, in spite of how much uh, push and and how much uh, time this feud has gotten, I I'm certainly hoping, and I have a feeling. That this is going to be a you know two or three minute squash on the pre-show. Yeah, I I could uh, definitely understand the reasoning behind that. I don't know. I it's really strange to me, or really kind of wild, how they can put some of these matches, especially matches that are you know decent profile matches, on the pre-show. But you know you may be right, and I. Uh, I really feel like, you know, this would be a great time to see what Nia Jax can do, especially Nia Jax being a champion. We mm-hmm. something brand new. That'd be something that kind of make people kind of go, huh? I think that'd be cool. But being on the pre-show, um, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that, but I think it, it probably should be compared to a lot of these other matches. Because yeah. let's be honest, this is not the matchup people are going to be clamoring to see right off the bat. And I think also, I think most people, unless you're a big Alexa Bliss fan, uh, you're hoping and expecting, especially with how WWE has been building this story and everything, and with their association with Be A Star and everything, you would think that this is going to be a two-minute squash. Yeah, and I understand that, you know, and that would be appropriate, especially on a pre-show, right? You don't want to see that on the actual card of Mania. So the placement, especially if it is a three to four minute squash, perfect place for it. Mm -hmm. So, well, we got to talk about the last thing, and that, of course, is about Barack Lesnar. Barack Lesnar. I tried. I really <laughs> tried. Uh, but yes, uh, well, when we talk about this Brock Lesnar... This may be the last time you get to say that. Uh, you're probably right. I think for a long time. I'll be a lot older probably the next time yeah. if I do get a chance to mention him again. Uh, but yes, on this, uh, especially on this Monday Night Raw review, let, let's get into this whole thing. Earlier in this show, we have Kurt Angle approach Paul Heyman and basically tell him, look... I need you not to incite anything with Roman Reigns. Don't go really deep or really, you know, cut in on him really hard because I don't want him to injure Brock Lesnar. And Payman laughs about it. You're, you're, you're saying you're worried about my client, Brock Lesnar, getting injured and just can laughs it off. That and, was and funny. That was I great. loved it. Uh, me too. Kurt, just, yes, I'm worried about it. And so uh, later on, and especially throughout the night, they kind of talk about this. But here we are at the main event time. And you have uh, Paul Heyman doing his normal thing in the middle of the ring with Brock Lesnar at his side, talking about everything that they're going to do. Uh, just really also, it's pretty strong on you know, maybe some real opinions that Brock Lesnar has. Uh, Paul Heyman runs with the gauntlet. I'll let you kind of talk more about what you think about some of the actual things. Uh, but they kind of go through the whole gauntlet of, you know, topics and really kind of tearing down Roman Reigns. And we have Roman Reigns show up and he has come to the party. Well, that party is kind of stopped because the locker room is on the ramp and they are not allowing Roman Reigns to come through. And it uh, doesn't take much convincing for those guys to part the sea. And uh, <laughs> Roman Reigns Damn, you comes. You took down. my line. I love it. Part. Uh, this is where they do uh, have you know the normal thing. Reigns comes down, approaches the champion, and what's going to happen? Well, you know you have Brock kind of eluding Reigns for a little while. Finally gets in the ring. Five Superman punches. 
They take down Brock Lesnar. He's laying in the ring, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he pops up, hits the F5, and then uh, gets out of the ring with his belt. I, I, I find this interesting for the fact that we have kind of the same things we see on a normal basis, but also for the fact five Superman punches, you got Roman Reigns holding the belt up high, and then all of a sudden a pop-up F5, everything's back to what it once was, and that's Roman Reigns laid out. I, I don't know. What, what do you think about this? I, I'm a little mixed on, on how I feel about this. Well, I mean, first off, when it came to the promo, um, I mean, you tell me what you think. Because, I mean, I think personally with all of the rumors and everything, all signs point to him to him leaving. But at the same time, with all of the references and them specifically mentioning UFC, does this mean that this is all just a work? You know what? It could be. It could be a big work, and I don't know. Because, trust me, there are times when they surprise me. I know it's not a popular thing to admit, uh, but there are times when WWE definitely swerves me, and I got caught up in some of the things in the past that they've done similar to this. I, I could see it being a work. I'm going to go no. I'm going to go that really Brock Lesnar's done. He's done all I can really do right now. They've got other people they want to push. Braun Strowman's the biggest guy they want to get around and get going. I think Brock Lesnar holds the company back. I think they're happy in waving him on to UFC and, and allowing him to do something new. I think this is about the time. I agree with you on the WWE side, um, what they should do at least. But, you know, you know how Vince is. He always thinks, you know, oh, a big, you know, uh, mainstream guy will always draw above any of my guys nowadays. Um, so I still think that, you know, uh, Vince will throw any sum of money at him. Um, do I think he's still gonna go to UFC? Yes, probably, but at the same time, especially with how much they mentioned it, I would not at all be surprised if Brock, or if Brock came back the night after Mania and was like, I'm still here! Um... But, uh, in terms of the whole segment, after the whole talking point and everything, first off, I loved, um, you know, like I said, I've mentioned it before, and, you know, seven, eight months ago, I would have been shocked if the, if my future self came to me and said this, but, you know, I'm not ashamed to admit anymore that, you know, I am a bit, I am a Roman fan. He's grown on me ever since Great Balls of Fire. Uh, you know, uh, so it was kind of cool seeing him. It, although it doesn't fully make sense, um, I get it's the whole reality era concept of, you know, uh, he's the locker room leader, it doesn't matter, heel or face. Uh, but it was kind of weird seeing, you know, both heels and faces parting the way for him to pass by and go uh towards Lesnar. Uh but you know it was an it was a cool segment. Um you know and then the whole Brock, you know, ending up on top in spite of five Superman punches. That's like I mentioned before with the whole Rousey Stephanie situation, it's all reverse momentum theorem shit. Uh you know they're you know, that's what WWE do, does nowadays. You know, simple as that. They they like giving the loser this, you know, little mini push ahead of the uh, match just so that, you know, it's this whole 50-50 booking stuff. Simple as that. Yeah, man, you're not wrong. And, you know, looking at this whole thing, as we said here, we've got the questions of Brock Lesnar's future. We've got Roman Reigns here actually getting a chance to have guys like yourself and I to become more of Roman guys compared to what we would have been in the past. 
And it's because that Brock Lesnar is that perfect foil. He does do some of the things that annoy some of the smarky fans. He takes lots of time off. He holds the WWE Universal Championship hostage Mm -hmm. as long as he holds it. So there's all those components all rolled up into a big, "Eh, maybe Roman's not so bad. (laughs) I mean, I'm sure that'll change in, you know, two months when Roman's holding the title, but... Yeah, yeah. We'll see, we'll we'll see how that goes following Mania. It'll be yeah. very interesting to see how the crowd is post Mania. Yeah, I'm you know, and here in Atlanta, you know, as, as Roman held the title up, we uh, definitely heard cheers and, and and some of the boos, and the boos started kind of coming in a little bit more stronger towards the end, right? So it's going to be fun to see how that crowd at WrestleMania is going to handle it. And that's not going to be the well, same Well, not crowd. even just that. The, the post-Mania Raw show mm-hmm. is going to be the bigger indication of, you know, where where is Reigns. Yeah. Well, you still have some smart you fans, though. Let's be honest. I mean, some of those, those post-Mania Raws are not really filled with the casuals. Oh, no, know? no. That's what I'm saying. That'll be yeah. a good indication of if he's gone over with the smarkier fans a oh, little okay. bit more than he was. You know, yeah. if he's just getting booed out of the building still, then WWE needs to be worried and, you know, say either A, you need to turn him heel pronto, or B, you need to have him be a transitional champion to Braun. Yeah, and I'm getting ahead of myself because my theory on it is he's going to get more happy cheers and stuff at Rank Mania, but I think once you have Brock Lesnar out of the picture, those same fans are going to say, oh, Brock's gone, now we can go back to hating Roman. Exactly. Well, that's that's always kind of been my opinion, you know, not as much for Roman, but still mostly for Roman, and definitely for Cena, where it's like, they're kind of in the middle against certain guys like a Miz, like, you know, like a Rusev, like some of the pure heels in the business, like a Brock, um, you know, you're going to cheer for them. But against just about anyone else, you're you're booing against them. Yeah, exactly. It's, you know, once again, I mean, I think we're going to get those crowds going and whether direction it goes, we're going to learn a lot. And, and not only that, I think the storyline and everything ensuing uh, really does make Roman Reigns a more tolerable champion, win, lose, or draw, only because, well, he shows up. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think that'll bring something different to what we've been seeing as of late. We'll actually have a heavyweight champion on Raw uh, every yeah, Monday. Fi- if fi- mm-hmm. Finally, th- maybe 2018 will be the year where the uh, top titles will actually mean more than the mid-card titles. Yeah, exactly. And that'll be a, a kind of odd situation for us here yeah. on Monday Night Raw. Cause, uh, well, we're not no, used both to that on, Monday, on Raw and SmackDown. Because think about it, Jinder held the title hostage for half the year on SmackDown. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, I didn't even think about it. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, we'll have to, to really see how we feel after Mania. Maybe you were right originally when you said this is all a swerve and Brock Lesnar is going to come back and they sign a new deal secretly behind doors and... Oof. Then we'll have a whole different conversation yeah. next Monday night. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, also, I mean, because the other thing you have to think about in terms of Brock is that, you know, even if you did say, you know, I want to go back to UFC, he still needs to sit out a whole year. Yeah, I, I believe. But some of the understanding on that, too, is that he... Uh, well, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I should keep my mouth shut. I've heard, though, that he has less time because technically if he says that he intends to come back, they just start the process and the testing while he's working for WB. But but he still has yet to say he intends to come back even. Yeah. I, so, I, 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 so, you know, his contract is supposed to be up at the after Mania, correct? Yes, after Mania, his contract is up. So, like, if he says, oh, I'm coming back to UFC the the day after Mania, that's when the clock starts. 
So he won't be able to compete in UFC until April of 2019. Yeah, and that's... So that's... he may, you know, I, I could totally see him signing like, another, like a year deal with WWE while getting under the, you know, getting back into the the uh, drug testing protocol for UFC and still competing in WWE for a year and then going back to going to UFC in 2019. Yeah, I mean, if it takes place like that, it's going to have to be for, I think, the better for Brock, only for the fact that he needs to get back into shape. He's going to have a lot of work to do. And he still, you know, looks good and all, but I mean, there's a difference between, oh. you know, WWE shape and UFC shape. Also, so. he has to lose like what twenty pounds. Yeah, I think so. Because so. he's like at what, like one eighty or two eighty five, based on WWE build weight. I think you're right. Yep. And so and the weight limit for the heavies in UFC is two sixty five. So a lot of work and yeah. it may take a year for him to do it. So maybe that's not such a bad deal. And maybe that actually is what they're looking at doing. I, I just kind of feel like Brock's ready. I, I think I have he's a feeling too, but you know, yeah. I, I could see that happening just because, you know, although he basically sits on the sideline for most of the year, regardless, but you know, maybe he, you know, wants to do at least a little something for the year that he has to sit on the sideline before he goes back into the octagon. It's going to be interesting. It really will be. And I'm, you know, I'm right with you on the fact that I feel like he is going to be wanting to hit that octagon sooner than later. So this could be the last time we talk Brock Lesnar here Mm -hmm. on Monday Night Raw. So let's see if that's the case, though. Once again, we could be swerved. I do want to say, though, uh, that, you know, at the end of this show, you still feel like that, you know, they gave the universal title its due, despite the fact that they kind of, you know, do the normal formula here at the end. I feel like at least it mattered, and I'm happy with that. I, I don't necessarily love it, but, hey, it worked out. Good job on them. I mean, the one thing. Honestly, I think this time, maybe it's just me being very cynical and everything, but I think this time mattered a lot more than most of the other times, what, the other five times that we've seen it over the last year, Mm -hmm. Uh, because all the other five times we kind of knew, okay, Brock, Brock is retaining, yada, yada, yada. This time you're thinking... Okay, finally we've gotten to that point that we've all been dr- both waiting for and dread- dreading at the same time for the last year of the moment where Brock finally loses the title and we get a real champion again. Yeah, exactly. And that's how a lot of people are feeling. And I think at the end of the day, we kind of understand that, you know, this is one of those situations you put yourself in when you got a guy leaving. Hopefully WWE understands that's why the fans feel so. Let's just hope we don't get a, uh, I mean, I'm sure we'll get a better, uh, a better match than this because, you know, Roman isn't going anywhere and he'll put the work in. But let's just hope we don't get a uh, Goldberg Lesnar Mania twenty match. Oh boy, let's, <laughs> uh, that's what I've I've had those worries. Trust me, I really have. So let's just hope that's not the case. Uh, but yeah, so let's go ahead and put a rating on this bad boy. I uh, wonder what you're going to give it. I, to me, I am myself going to give this a six. I feel like that it was a decent show. There were some snidbits and things that we cared about. There were some interesting facts that we can take forward. But I, I really feel like Rollins and Balor was the best match. Uh, main event did what it needed to do. Didn't overdo it, though. Um, besides that, it just kind of it, it was okay. Even the opening segment was good, but it wasn't great. Yeah, I'll give it slight edge. I'll give it a six and a half just for the rollins Balor match because that was definitely the best part of this whole show um you know other than that you know i i get it i get the whole reverse momentum theorem but you know the opening say the end of the opening segment leaves a sour taste in your mouth the end to the closing segment also leaves a sour taste in your mouth 
Um, you know, and besides that, you know, there isn't really much to write home about on this show. Mm hmm. And hey, that's expected. It's a go home show. We should understand that. But you I would think, think, you know, I mean, maybe this is just me, you know, thinking too far into it. But you know, most of the time, especially back in the day, the the go home show for Mania was big. It was the final push to get people to con- you know to convince people, hey, watch this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean that's exactly what they're supposed to do, and I think that it, it, to some extent they try to. Um, but still, once again, there are some things that just kind of just was uh, uh, okay. I get it, you know, and I think that's the way you kind of walked away with this thing. I, I still feel like the bigger things is you know exactly why people are going to be watching this show. So. Uh, but yeah, that pretty much wraps up Monday Night Raw for us tonight. Uh, we appreciate all of you that did come and join us. We've had a lot of fun. We've really gotten deep in some of these things because, well, WrestleMania right around the corner, and we kind of had to. So let's make sure that we let you know a couple of things here before we leave you. We want to let you guys know that if you like this show, hey, go hit that subscribe button over to the W2M Network. Once you do that, you'll get this show every single week along with all of our other great review shows like SmackDown Live, 205 Live, which Brandon's a part of both those great shows with Harry and Liz. They do an excellent job. And we'll, you don't want to miss those. We'll be doing a very special, like, bigger, uh, you know, We'll be doing our WrestleMania predictions as well tomorrow after we do the review of SmackDown. Exactly. So that's awesome. So I'm really excited about that. I can't wait to hear all three of them break down what they feel like is going to be taking place at WrestleMania. It's going to be an awesome show. Also, don't forget, me and Brandon will be breaking down NXT. We got a double shot of it. That's right. Last week we missed one. We're going to give you a double shot of NXT coming up this Friday morning. Thursday nights when we're recording it. Make sure you go check that out. That's going to be a lot of fun. And we may even give you some sneak peeks on what we think are going to be what's going to be the actual conclusions of what the matches will be at NXT TakeOver in New Orleans. Uh, Also, uh, Wrestling to the Max, uh, Sean and I uh, will be bringing that to you this week as well. Probably a double dose, so come check us out over there. And also, make sure you go find all of our other great podcasts and everything else over there at the W2M Network. Just go hit that subscribe button, like I said before, and you'll get all the great shows that we have to offer. 411mania.com and lastwordonprowrestling.com are also great friends of ours, and we want to make sure you go support them because they support us. They'll do some, uh, of course, WrestleMania stuff that you're not going to want to miss out on either. So go check all that out. Uh, Really, really excited about that. And like I said before, we've had fun tonight. This is Monday Night Raw. But make sure tomorrow night, like Brandon just said, make sure you check out SmackDown Live and 205 Live leading into WrestleMania. They're going to do a great job. And in that WrestleMania preview that they're going to give you, It's going to be a lot of fun. Don't miss a minute of the action this week. Until then, guys, we will catch you guys later. From myself and Mr. Brandon Bisco being peace out.